Okay, so hello everybody. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for Veronica for inviting me here, all her patience with me. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk about um, basically it's going to be a quick journey from the nick of the servers all the way to the edge in our production network how we practically de deploy IPv6, right? Of course, I could stop in every single item for, for a long time, but uh, I'm going to go through it very quick, and maybe we, don't, we can do Q&A in the end. If I say something terribly wrong in the middle, please feel free to interrupt, right? So quick agenda, very quick, who I am. I'm going to share some numbers. Some numbers are kind of outdated, but these are the latest public ones that I found. As I said, it's going to be a walkthrough from the server, rack, data center, backbone, and edge about the IPv6 deployment. And then I'm going to comment about some other IPv6 specific applications that, that we are running, right? And some questions in the end. So my name is Mikael. I'm a network guy based in Dublin. Uh, I'm with Facebook since 2012. Uh, and I went through multiple different teams. Uh, while I was here. Uh, network infrastructure engineering, previously called NetOps, data center network engineering. I'm now focusing more on the backbone side. And I have a lot of IPv6 t-shirts, right? <laughs> Some of these are not due to happy things, like vendors sending you t-shirts with the bug IDs that you found. That's, um, <laughs> that's, um, that's uh, something I don't know to be proud of or not. 2012 was rough, right? Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I made it. So uh, a little bit of the numbers, right? So Facebook, Facebook scale. So basically every, oh, hold on. So this is, the, this is the world map, right? Every connection there that you see every line of light is a connection between people, right? So as you can see, Facebook spans across the globe. And uh, at the moment, we have 2.7 billion monthly active users, unique users, and out of those 1.37 billion are daily unique users. An interesting thing to point out is like 85% of those users are outside of the United States, um, which means that we basically are a truly global service, right? So in a specific about IPv6, so as of today, or I think these are 2016 numbers, 60% of the user traffic is over IPv6. Uh, out of that, 50% of US mobile traffic, more than 50% of US mobile traffic, is already v6. And it keeps increasing quarter or month every month as new handset or new operators activate this. This is also not news, but 99.99, or, or, or a lot of nines, of internal traffic is IPv6, right? And I actually hunt down every single v4 bit that is out there uh, to finish it. So how would do we build this, right? So let's start with the servers, right? Uh, as you know, we, 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 we develop our own servers, part of the Open Compute uh, program. Uh, we only have one NIC per host in these generations. This is, I think, Windmill. Uh, these are pretty old ones. But we also have uh, more fancy versions of this, which are the multi-host NICs, right? So in this diagram here, you can see one, how one NIC is shared across four microservers. These are PCI-based uh, microservers. And basically, this multi-host NIC connects to the top of rack. So how does the server configuration look like? So we use a static configuration. We use Chef to manage this. The prefix length of the servers is a slash 64. An interesting one is like we use the same default route across the entire fleet, meaning that the default route for all these servers across all different racks are the same, which is like this. Um, basically, we configure the link local address, and it makes be things very easy for provisioning inside of things. You don't need to worry about who's my, what's my default route. It's always the same. We use BEP down to the server to announce BIPs and services. And we use slash 64 because this is more TCAM friendly scale with the, with, um, based on different hardware requirements, right? And we do use DHCP v6 in the provisioning phase. Something interesting we found here is that the array interval, 
just a note, we had to set it up pretty low uh, for provisioning purposes, right? If the array is not quick enough, you are actually provisioning P PXC, BIOS, subsistence can time out. So we had to tune that quite aggressively. OK, so we have a server, nothing very magical here, right? But then we have those servers, they get grouped in a rack, right? So we have a 64 per rack. Currently, we use four BP uplinks. The interconnects are 127. And uh, in this first generation that I'm going to talk about, we, we use um, V4 and V6 BGP sessions over the same transport, right? Initially, we started with this, and we hit a lot of bugs, right? Um, I, I can talk more later on, but things like around neighbor discovery or ARP, both protocols not really talking to each other, or when you lose the nest hop in one, in one uh, address family, black hole in traffic in the other address family. So it was, was a lot of operational pain, right? But there is a reason why we went there. So on the rack side, we have, as I said, the IP6 link local address is the same facing the VLAN to the servers, right? So these are, this is really handy to implement things like, for example, do you want to have different MTUs per subnet? So for example, in mind if you are in, a, in an edge environment, uh, you don't want to announce a big MSS out to the internet, right? But you might want to have a bigger MTU within your cluster, right? So in this way, you can lock the default route to a given MSS, let's say 1460, or 1440, and then have another static route with a, with a bigger subnet with a bigger MTU. Again, if it's, if it's the same everywhere, it's easier to manage, right? So we have lots of racks, as you can imagine. We have a lot of east-west traffic, and we mainly have two data center architectures, right? This is, was kind of a decision that was made by the data center engineering team. It also helped to scale the team. We always try to maintain two architectures and try to kill all the legacy stuff, right? So, um, because the teams are really small, and that's the only way to scale. So, these two architectures, right? We have what we call four post clusters. So, so I said, this is a legacy topology built on big switches, right? We only use BGP for these clusters, IBGP, BGP, and we use CS ECMP forever, right? And this is a pretty big unit of deployment. We, unit of deployment. We are talking hundreds of racks, right? That's the minimum unit of deployment. So basically, we have the racks. This is what we call CSWs, cluster switches. We uplink them all together. And, uh, and this is what we call a cluster, right? Nothing, nothing special here. Uh, basically, as I said, they aggregate uh, hundreds of racks. They, they are dual stack. We do a, a 64 per rack. We aggregate these full racks in a 52, right? We use IPv4 in these racks, uh, in these clusters, these all, all clusters, as last 24. But of course, if you have v4 and v6, that means that this uh, big uh, cluster switch needs to have a lot of BP sessions because we are doing v4 and v6, right? So we, we were hitting a scaling problems. We were doing things like we are running out of file descriptors in the, in the Linux subsystem of the, of the cluster switch. Or the CPU couldn't keep up with so many keep allies, blah, blah, blah. So basically, we moved to multi-protocol BGP in order to, um, to overcome that. It wasn't desirable, but we had to keep the network running, right? So then we went to the final version, what we call, right? We do IPv6 only services. There was no RFC 5949 support anywhere. Uh, at the time, I don't know the, the last, last time I checked either, but basically 5949, for the, ways, for the ones that are not aware, is um, basically advertising an IPv6 network over, uh, with an IPv6 next hop. So imagine that you want to have only IPv6 uh, BEP sessions, but still transport some IPv4 network information. So we had to keep the we had to keep the MPBGP uh, over V4 to be able to scale with the BEP sessions, right? In order to, in order to save uh, addressing schema, addressing space on the V4, we use non-routed non IPV4 uh, address space, which means that basically the v V6 interconnects were pingable from the outside, were reachable, but not the V4 space. 
but we went further and the V4 space within the racks are, are the same across all the racks in the infrastructure, right? So the only routable and reachable uh, space was IPv6. And of course, this is what we are deploying now, it's pretty public. Uh, so the data, the data center fabric is basically, it's a building-wide fabric. It's built with a smaller boxes, in this case, uh, six-pack and, and, um, and backpack uh, that we build locally and we open source on the Open Com Compute project. Here in the blue one is the 40 gig version and then the 100 gig version. So the fabric from the beginning was dual stack. In this case, we finally were able to cope with the scale and we, we did separate v4 and v6 sessions. In this case, we break down the unit of deployment from hundreds of racks to a smaller set of racks, which we call server pods, which were 48 racks. We had similar aggregation, right? 64 per rack, 59 per pod in this case instead of 52, a 52 per cluster, in this case is a collection of pods. And, um, and this is how the fabric kind of looks like, right? The representations. So how do we have IPv4 services in IPv6 only clusters? Because either for acquisitions or some legacy systems, we still need to have the ability now it's less, but especially at that time, to, to be able to have reachability to some of these services, right? So we did this trick, right? Uh, all racks have 169.254.0016, the same, the same subnet, right? And, and basically, we use BGP injection to inject those VIPs to the local rack, which means that um, the remote, the, the, if I'm in another DC, I go, I don't, I'm not going to see the next hop being the rack itself, the subnet, because everything is CBGP, so the next hop gets rewritten. It's okay if, if the subnet is the same across all the boxes, right? Um, and for, of course, for IPv6, we do it natively, right? But the fact that we can have the same subnet across all the racks, uh, we basically are not consuming IPv4 IP space anymore. So we have a lot of DCs, right? And we need to interconnect all this. So we run a global backbone. In this backbone, we interconnect what we call origin DCs and POPs, right? So um, basically, this backbone is used for those two purposes, DC to DC, all the replication, photos, all these backend services, and traffic to users and, and cache. We use ISIS as, I, as, an, as the IGP, and the backbone is based on MPLS and RSVPT. And we run a BEP free core. So um, in the very, very early, early days, uh, we were basically putting the V6 traffic on the IGP itself, right? Because there wasn't much, right? Just a few tests here and there. But as the traffic started to ramp up, we wanted to have the T, T abilities. Uh, and we started researching this, right? Basically, there was no native IPv6 RSVP implementation at the time. And we had a BEP free core, right? And again, nobody had this 5949 implemented. So we had to figure out how we provided a, a first class support on the backbone for V6. Um, let's see. So we went through mu multiple decisions about what to do with, with our actual IGP and, and the backbone configuration. And the, the main two candidates that we end up with was uh, BGP label unicast or IGP shortcuts, right? Or the equivalent to auto route announce in other vendors. Uh, so both have pros and cons, uh, but then pretty much everybody agreed on, on getting onto this, right? On IGP shortcuts. The, the support on the vendor at the time was good, and then, and then uh, it, it seemed in general less convoluted. But we don't have only one backbone, right? We recently published in the network at scale that we have, we are building a parallel backbone, I mean, it's in production, which we call express backbone, right? This is a dedicated DC to DC SDN, I hate this word, sorry, but uh, it's, um, it's really software defined network in the sense that we run our own stack we run our own routing protocols and 
it's a hybrid between a centralized and a local decision um, network, right? So interesting about, about these networks is it looks like a DC, right? Basically, we run four parallel planes across our DCs, meaning that um, it's like, in reality, it's like four parallel backbones. So the control plane scale remains within the plane. So in this network, we, we don't even route IPv4. We only do v6. There is no any, they are not even routing policies to support v4. For IGP, we use OpenR, which is our, our, our own IGP, which we announced multiple, multiple times. Um, we we, we want to say that it's a, it's a routing platform, not only an, an IGP, because we can build applications on top of that. It's extensible in that sense. So, so we went through the, the racks, the DC, the backbone, but how do users reach out to Facebook, right? So all those 2.707 billion users access to Facebook through, through the Edge network, right? Oops. Um, basically, we have all these pops deployed all over the place, and uh, every single bit goes through the pops, right? We don't have any direct access to the internet to the DCs. So very brief, why we are deploying pops. So let's say I'm in location X, and my origin DC is in Oregon, right? My TCP round trip in this case is 150 milliseconds, right? But in reality, it takes much longer to get the first bit of data out of a, a TCP connection, out of a, out of a client, right? So in this case, SSL termination takes 450 milliseconds. So the first contact, content, the user will get it at 600 milliseconds. So very easy. We deploy a pop very close to the users. We reduce that round trip time for the TCP connect and the, all the SSL establishment. And basically, we can reduce the round time dramatically. So up to the SSL piece, we went down to 90 milliseconds. And then we use HTTP pipelining for pre-established TCP connections back to the origin. And we reduce the latency dramatically for these users. So basically, we move from 150 to initial TCP connect or 600 for the HTTP response to 240. So basically, initially, we build just routers, right? Just to get peering and some connectivity to the, to the backbone, right? And then we say, hey, let's deploy these servers to get some TCP termination and some content, right? But then the content grew, right? So we start deploying this equivalent to, to clusters in the DC, which is very similar topology as we deployed in the DC. But then this grew even faster and even more. And we built this, right? Which is like when we can span across, across metros where peering and compute is not in the same location. So again, on this design, we inherited a lot of concepts from the DC, right? Again, BEP everywhere. We keep it simple, a 64 per rack, 50 per cluster, and we announce a 48 per metro. So if we have multiple clusters in the metro, uh, we still announce a slash 48. One very important thing is like all edge to origin traffic is IPv6. Regardless how the users reach out to us, we always talk back to origin in IPv6. So in this case, we basically, the user will reach out to us in IPv4, and then we proxy back everything to origin in IPv6 for all, all the backend services. Very important also, all the east-west traffic, which is more than what we send back to users within the pop itself, is also 100% IPv6. So this means basically we have no NATs at all, right? Everything is done on the proxies. So I have no knowledge at all about NAT technologies. <laughs> I'm not interested. Um, so that's on that front, right? So often people ask about like, what is IPv6 giving me other than more IPs? Or some, some people say like more cost or less cost, or these things. We actually found, apart from the, apart from the obvious thing that we were and we, 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 we did run out of IPs, right? There are some applications that are just not possible with IPv4, right? So some of them, some of these very brief, right? 
So this concept of IP per task, right? Let's just start from that. So on Facebook, we, we have containers, right? Containers is, uh, is a hot thing now. Uh, you are not cool if you don't have containers. Um, <laughs> and we have a lot of containers, right? <laughs> Uh, actually, people, people say sometimes, well, you only have one app. Well, not really, right? I mean, we are talking about millions, right? Uh, so um, every little thing there, maybe there is a task handling the, your messenger notifications. Maybe the, your messenger notifications for just videos or for just this, right? So it's a, we, we, we distribute these workloads uh, in order to use network storage and memory as much as possible, and we leverage containers, right? We don't run on Docker or Kubernetes or similar like that. We have our own implementation, but you can think about a mix of Docker plus Kubernetes. So what are the current challenges with, with, um, with our current uh, container deployments, right? So right now, we assign one IP per host, right? So this means that we need a port per container task, right? So if we are running multiple, multiple, um, multiple tasks on the same host, we need multiple ports. Every restart, this, uh, this task gets a different port, which basically we have a service discovery uh, system that is adding a lot of load and churn here, right? Um, this basically causes port collisions and, and the allocation, the code for allocation is probably 30% of the scheduler. Uh, so basically, we are given this dream that you can run multiple containers, but then you don't have the 65,000 ports for you. So, so it's not real, right? So it's also very painful for traffic accounting, right? So we have. We have this um, collector running on every host at Facebook, equivalent to NetFlow for every server. So it's very hard for us now to account or do um, accounting of traffic when you have tens of tasks. There is no an easy way to differentiate this, right? Which task is causing more traffic, especially if the ports are dynamic and everything is dynamic. So we wanted to fix this, right? So. How we can do this? Well, let's abuse IPv6. Uh, and we decided to, well, let's do, what about doing a 64 per host? So every server at Facebook gets a slash 64. This is in production and rolled out everywhere. We basically adapted the container address allocation mechanism. So now um, each host will allocate one IP address per task or per container per process. And each task basically gets its own slash 128. Uh, and also gets its own port number space, which makes the scheduling and accounting easier. And there are no more port collisions, right? So think about this. Do we even really need ports anymore? Right? If every task, every process has a dedicated IP, the reason ports were made is to actually multiplex applications in the same host, but if we have one application, one IP, do we even need ports? So um, basically the host now uses the, the 64 that is delegated to him uh, as a pool. We actually allocate the column column one just for troubleshooting purposes to the actual Ethernet zero interface. To, so we can actually test the end-to-end -end routing up to the equivalent to, to the DOM zero or the actual, um, you know, the main host. Uh, and we found an interesting thing, right? When basically this was a completely new addressing schema that was on the top of the current one, right? <coughs> so when you, are, when you are doing this, you, you, you want to control who talks to what, right? So, Let's say, that, um, let's say that you generate a TCP connection from, from this other space that is not, a, is not a still routed in the backbone, right? That means that the return paths are going to be black holed. So we had to control to make sure that no connections were originated from the host, no TCP connections were initiated from the host that weren't replied, that weren't reached out uh, before, meaning that if I open a TCP socket to some website or some application, I'm not going to use 
that address space, uh, but I, I'm going to use it if, if I get a, a request, right? So basically, we configure these aliases here, the 2803 subnet. That's a block that we got from LACNIC. This is the, the 2401 is the actual native one. And then we, over, we, we basically routed this on top. And we, we set this lifetime to zero. That basically means that no connections will be originated from that host. This was very helpful uh, because, yeah, we hit a pretty nasty one uh, on the initial rollout. So um, again, how will we roll this, right? So this is, a, again, we have our IPv6 schema already deployed. This is a complete IPv6 address on top of the current one. So we have to reconfigure every single device in the network. Reconfigure every top of rack, every aggregation switch, everything, right? In a couple of weeks. So um, <clears throat> we have the spine, we have the pod, and the rack, right? So in this case, we assign a slash 54 to a rack, a slash 46 per pod, and then I think we aggregate the fabric in uh, something bigger, like a slash 37. Uh, again, um, we follow the aggregation principles, you know, in order to be gentle with the TCAM and, and, and the hardware constraints. Uh, but it was basically, yeah, a, a new rollout, right? On the rack side, you say, well, you have a slash 54. That's too many addresses, right? So, yeah, that's actually 1,024, I think, slash 64s. Well, you cannot fit 1,024 servers in a rack. Well, we actually have open source some blueprints about running microservers in PCI, very small cards. Yeah, we cannot run 1,024 servers, but who knows uh, in the future. At the moment, uh, we do something that it might sound hacky, but it's actually very handy. On the rack, we basically pre-compute all the subnets possible, and we basically use the same bit that is on the native v6 uh, prefix and this new raw, uh, block aggregated, uh, sorry, overlaid, and we basically generate a static routes. So we have, I think it's around 400 static routes in every single rack pointing to these servers. So do I know if, I, if it's a server there? No, but if, if it comes up, it's very, it's very easy for me to compute what is going to be the subnet for, for this server, because I just derive it from there and from the 54. So this project, uh, basically, with this, we, we, we got the, the first goal, which was to get IP per task to fix these port collision problems. But this enabled other bigger project, which is called ILA, right? Identifier Locator Addressing, right? So ILA basically is the aim to provide location independence on the addressing and mobility built in on the network without any fancy overlay, tunneling, or anything like that. We basically split the IPv6 address in two. Um, and basically, the, the locator will be the first 64 bits. This is the routable piece, right? And then the identifier will be the, the last 64 bits, which will be the, the identifier of the task ID, right? Basically, this task ID. We, we talked about before about the restarts, right? Every time we restart a task, a port might change, the location might change, right? But the principle that we are trying to follow is here is that the task ID itself will be unique for the lifetime of that container, or uh, there's some complex algorithm that I don't remember, uh, that it will determine one ID, right? That ID will be encoded in those 64 bits, and then we, the tasks will communicate with that task ID, and the network will solve it in the in the backend, right? The, we wrote a draft for this. Um, so, okay, so this this shouldn't be here, but basically in this slide, in the in this piece, up to the double column, that will be the locator. In this case, it's column column one because there is no any task ID running in the in the actual real host, right? But basically, all the other 64 bits will be filled uh, for any task running there. Right? So we can run I don't know, millions, billions, a lot. So 
just to give you an idea about the, the deployment phases that we went through, right? I mean, this is this is obviously was very quick, but it didn't take that that uh, little time, right? So in 2018, sorry, in 2008, we started uh, some discussions about this IPv6 thing, right? What we're gonna do, right? We did some hacky stuff with some load balancers here and there. Okay, ping, it works. Uh, and then um, we started some discussions about the IEP situation, right, in 2009, and start some trials in the small pieces of the network. In 2010, we successfully mi migrated the IEP without bringing, bringing the network down. And uh, we were very active on the, on the IPv6 world uh, effort, right? Um, on 2012, because our traffic was growing very rapidly, we deployed IGP shortcuts because the solution of running just uh, routing everything on the IGP wasn't working anymore. Um, the data center was basically, this was a partnership between mainly PulseUp and a bunch of other engineering teams. The data center engineering team, we partnered uh, very strongly with, with, with Paul and we we basically pushed the vendors and hit every bug that you can imagine, um, both on the hardware level, forwarding level, um, control plane, um, and we finally rolled out dual stack in, in the DC at the network level, uh, at least in 2013, and we started pushing that to the edge as well. So basically the team had this goal in 2014 to start deploying IP6 native V6 clusters, meaning that we will start deploying clusters and IPv4 will be an exception. We will use things like this beep injection or some other methods. Um, by 2015, we crushed it pretty much and uh, all the clusters except one were IPv6 only. Uh, today I can say that basically vast majority, I mean almost 100% of the traffic is IPv6 and all this investment that we've been doing all these years, now they, oh, of course, makes sense, right? It wasn't that clear in 2008, right? And this is where the organizations need to have a little bit of long-term vision and, and alignment because now we can do things like ILA, IP per task and everything is awesome but is it takes a lot of time, right? It takes a village. Um, so, a few words here. So, to make IPv6 a reality, right? I mean, this is a no-brainer, right? There needs to be alignment between network and application teams. I mean, I will argue that the network is probably the easiest part. Uh, um, the applications need to go hand in hand, in hand right? So, in this case, uh, for this team that was working so aggressively on the IPv6, they blended between the application and the network. And these folks were on call 24 by 7. <laughs> it, it was very rough, right? Because when you wanna, when you wanna push something, you, you also need to be willing to put a, a little bit extra, right? Then you need to make it part of the roadmap. Take it seriously, right? Uh, and, and basically, you make it, need to make it part of your roadmap and your partner team's roadmap. Um, if people are not e identified or incentivized enough, it's harder, right? So at Facebook, we have this bottom-up approach. I know it's, it's not very common in other organizations. We have this thing as like, how is this? Nobody at, nothing at Facebook is somebody else's problem. So basically, you see something broken, fix it. Uh, but in generally, I would say it helps if management is invested in the mission, right? Facebook is a mission-driven company, which means people believe in what we're doing, um, and the infrastructure teams believed in V6 as a mission, right? So people had to be aligned for that. And I'm not gonna lie, it's not gonna be an easy ride, but I think we are not anymore in those hardcore, yet hardcore days where you know, you, you, you could hit all sorts of things. I would like to think that majority, big, vast majority of the problems, at least on the network layer, and more and more on the applications with moves like Apple forcing people, forcing applications to work on V6, we are much better than we were a few years back. But one advice, right? 
we have this concept of iteration of Facebook, right? We, we prefer iterate versus architect, right? Which means like you can do a very, very nice uh, architecture, right? But if you stand still, world changes. So please try things, test again, and iterate again, because probably the environment change again. And in general, I would say, let's try less documents and more deployments. <laughs> um, and start yesterday, please, because um, it's going to be painful otherwise, and, um, and it's really fun. Any questions? for Mikael. Okay, Ed. Sure, yeah, shut me up. So um, the question on the pre-allocation for, for per rack, per server, was there a reason you decided to go that way versus DHCP v6 PD? Uh, was it just a preference in terms of what Chef was capable of doing and, and automating in the data center that way? And then this looked like principally a data center conversation. Uh, any insights into the campus side too? Okay, so why, why not use P DHCP 6 PD? Yeah, so in general, we try to simplify things as much as possible. For example, if we can avoid to deploy a new protocol or something, we don't do it, right? The reason being is like, the more stuff you deploy, network engineers, we love protocols, right? We, we love, oh, BGP, RSVP, I mean, we get excited with these things. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's basically a baggage that then you need to carry for any new vendor, any new platform that you need to qualify. So in general, the less protocols we, we have, the better in general, right? So what is easier than static routes? Uh, for, so it fit for us. We control the environment. We can pre-compute all these components. We can store this information in our backend. Uh, it was the simplest way for us. And I think the SCP uh, PD at the time wasn't even supported in some of our platforms, right? Majority of our, of our top of racks now are, are done by us, which means that we could, we could write that piece of code. It's not a problem. But again, it's like that, that has some maintainability cost as well. So for our case, it was just simpler. Right? In terms of the campus, I, I work on the production, on the production network. Uh, I don't have that much insight on the campus side. Uh, I, I can say that our offices are V6 only. So V6 is a thing, um, and, um, and the, we are turning off V4, turning off V4, I think, in a few places. But uh, I'm not 100% updated on that. Maybe, Mikhail, I would ask um, the users on the internet that are coming from the V4-only world, you said 16% use the traffic on V6, that means 84%, uh, if I'm doing my maths right, is V4. So how do those people get to the data center content, which is on V6? How yeah. do they do that? So basically, we have, we have multi -la multiple layers of, of load balancers or proxies. So we have our L3 load balancer, which we call SHIB, uh, then that goes to um, a bunch of layer seven uh, load balancer, which we call a proxy gen. Uh, basically, the TCP termination, the TCP handshake happens in V4. From then on, everything is V6. So the way we basically interconnect the V4 or legacy world with V6 is, um, is with proxies. Okay, thank you. Questions there? Hi. Um, I don't know whether you, whether you plan to have measured this, but would end users see a difference in terms of performance, whether they're accessing via V6 or V4? Yeah, I, sh I forgot to ask this, but really good question. So this has been a very good topic, very great topic. And if you saw Paul um, talking about this thing, um, so we actually saw very significant, in some cases, dramatic improvements on performance in V6, right? Uh, I think the lay, we basically have a huge user base and uh, we control the handsets. Actually, the same network stack and libraries that run on the phone is the same software that runs in our load balancers. So the load balancer library is the same that runs on the Facebook app, which means we can actually um, control how we do V6, what we prioritize, one versus the other, right? So basically in the A-B testing that we did, 
I think the average result was 15% um, uh, improvement on the performance. And in some, in some cases, where with very high-end devices, on video, we found 30 to 35%. Um, but uh, these numbers in specific, I think Paul mentioned a few months ago, the 15% for sure, and I know in some high-end devices is even bigger. We don't know exactly 100% why is this. I mean, there's the theory, yeah, you have cardiac grade nuts. Some other people will say, oh, you have some uh, TCP acceleration or TCP optimizers, which they don't really optimize. Uh, <laughs> and, and somebody will say, well, V6 is not congested, right? For example, some different part. Um, just tying into that, I was just wondering, um, you didn't really mention explicitly about CDN, but I guess do you, so you have your own sort of CDN approach, presumably it's all V6 as well. Sorry, could you, could you repeat that? The, the, you didn't really mention explicitly sort of the CDN infrastructure. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether, whether it is explicit in yours or... Yeah, so when, when, when I say the edge, it's actually the CDN, right? Right. So in the, in the, in the edge, we basically do, I would say, three functions, right? Well, four functions. We connect with our peers to exchange traffic in the closest location to, to the people we serve. Right? Uh, we do TCP termination to improve the latency piece. Right? And we do content cache. Right? And fourth, we connect back to the backbone. So we do all those four functions. In the very, very early days where the actual traffic was terminated back in the DC, the, the data center had the view of the internet, but we were basically backhauling all that traffic coming from a given uh, provider. That's not the case anymore. Now we moved everything to the edge years ago. In the beginning, we just started with TCP termination. And then, OK, content like video and photos started growing. Clusters started to become bigger. So there is a very big investment on that front. Then a program, very successful program that we've been running now for years is called FNA, Facebook Network Appliance, where we can actually install gear in the ISPs, uh, simil similar to other content providers, to basically reduce even further another layer of cache without exiting that network. And we've been doing, we've been, we've been pretty, pretty direct with the operators to that V6 support on FNA is mandatory. And it's, so it's sort of all your stuff, there's not no third party stuff in there. Sorry? There's no third party um, sort of systems in there, then basically it's all pure. We run, our, we run our own CDN. Yeah. Right. So um, what's that remaining less than 1% of IPv4 traffic internal? Yeah, those guys. Um, it's much less than 1%. Uh, I, I can actually, actually... I was actually going to ask if you would be brave enough to filter off the ether types and see yeah. what would happen. <laughs> oh, the filter of the ether types? Yeah, could be. I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, so... Uh, Mostly, mostly that's uh, on very, very, very old clusters with very old applications. Uh, we might have something, but I'm talking two, three years ago. The last time I checked was it didn't even show up in the graph. But then there are other, other, other things like some industrial components that we use, for example, uh, stuff to manage the, the ventilation system of the DCs or the temperature, sensors, things like that, right? Those things are generally not very modern, but we are working with the industry to actually push back, right? Uh, on the company, we, we made this stance multiple times ago, well, multiple years ago, a product doesn't get released, even if it affects revenue, if it's not V6 compatible, right? And that's clear, there's no debate, right? Uh, we don't work with any other vendor, network vendor that, of course, doesn't do V6, right? So we keep pushing the boundary until, until everything that we do is V6. Um, forgive me if I missed part of this on the slide, but I was quite curious as to how you were dealing with imaging of your hosts uh, in, a, in an IPv6 only environment. So I don't work on that piece, but uh, the team that does work next to me. So we, you, we use PXC and, uh, and DHCPv6. Uh, basically, I think what, what happens is we relay some data to the DHCP server based on some DHCP relay information, I guess will be the MAC address, and that basically provides the bootstrapping piece and then the provisioning happens. 
That's all V6. All the provisioning is V6 only. That was, that was very tough because we had to work with, with, with the firmware, with the, with the NIC providers, with the, with the motherboards, everything, right? And very, very, very weird current cases. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, had, I wanted to mention something. Mm -hmm. um, often people say like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I come from a different organization. Uh, well, I need the support from my director, from my CEO, or, or, or even higher. Um, I mean, yes and no, right? In the end of the day, um, if a bunch of people get together, usually things, things move forward, right? So I will say, in your organization, try to identify some decision makers. Doesn't need to be managers, right? Just people that can help you move things forward. And again, don't try to solve everything in one shot. Build some prototypes, build some momentum, and then move forward, and then replicate, right? Uh, 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 at Facebook, when we, when we presented this to, to our VP of Infra, uh, the only thing that he told us is like, okay, if you do it, be the best, right? And uh, that's what we are trying. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mikhail.